Okay, so welcome all. Uh, very happy to uh, introduce Joaquin. Uh, I'm probably going to make a mess of it. Lopez Arise. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he's uh, at uh, in Madrid and well, very well known people in the in person uh, in the uh, pet specs and I hear now ultrasound community as well. So. He was in London for a conference NPL and uh, decided to pass by, which is great. So he's going to give us three different topics on the state of the world. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I mean, just preparing a title for something like this was uh, basically it's a, a, a summary of you know, the things that uh, we have uh, been working on lately. and. Of course, just try to see like uh, if there are common interests and, and the kind of things that uh, I like from having this kind of uh, meetings with uh, groups uh, talking about fun stuff apart from talking about brands and all that that's <laughs> the exciting part. So actually, uh, so this is uh, since uh, we're in a group in, in Madrid, it's Complutense University. Um, okay. So this is uh, more or less uh, our group. We're in the uh, physics uh, department at uh, Complutense. So this is uh, we are in a nuclear physics group. So and we are basically working like around one day working on a nuclear experiment and nuclear um, uh, detectors. Uh, one there in theoretical and and, well, and probably more than one there right now in, in application in. In medicine, especially with uh, image reconstruction, and part of that is also working on the ultrasound, as, as I will, as I will explain. So these are uh, different topics that uh, we are involved. So uh, some years ago, we started also working on proton therapy because it's a good combination of, especially just the, the part that involves uh, uh, PET uh, detection of the uh, proton activation in these uh, therapies, and actually this is one of the of the hot topics right now because there has been a few centers open in, in Madrid in the last few years and there are more that are being planned. So this is something that is uh, is gathering a lot of interest. Um, well, apart from these topics, also with uh, a lot of uh, Monte Carlo simulation that traditionally our group has been uh, uh, working a lot on that. And the part of artificial intelligence is also connecting the simulation and the improvement, especially for the, for the design. So this is our group and, and well, these are this, uh, what's uh, we're working in, in Madrid in, in Spain. There's a, a different centers. So as, as Chris was saying, we were talking a little bit before. So there's a groups in, in Valencia. In so there's a, in, in Barcelona they are more on, on spec. In Madrid there are actually a couple of uh, centers and, and building also uh, some scanners at TMS. So there's a large heterogeneous uh, network that actually is kind of uh, difficult. So maybe we can just talk about that a little bit later. But uh, this is something that uh, the, the, the strongest part of our group is mostly on the, on the reconstruction, and I think that this is where you have a lot of uh, So I just uh, prepare more or less the, the topics in these uh, four areas. I, I actually would like just to, to, to explore the, the ones and talk maybe later in the discussion and, and more the ones that you may find more interesting because I think that we we are involved uh, in very different topics. Of course, it depends on and each one has been. Uh, related to the few uh, PhD thesis, so so this is actually one of the reasons that uh, we have these uh, different topics, and I will just go through them. And of course, if at some point you have some some questions or some ideas or something, you just raise your hand or let me know. So the first topic, and this is something that uh, we work uh, uh, a little bit uh, uh, the last few years, more few years before, especially because depending on the data. So this is try to uh, have a, a pet data and from that just to, to detect the uh, cardiac motion and, and correct for that. So this is something that was more or less known, but I will explain why it was more challenging in our case and how we, we handled that. So well, just a brief introduction about the topic. Usually if you're interested in, in using pet for cardiac studies, the, the, the main limitation in terms of resolution or one of the means is the, the cardiac motion. And typically how it is done is just to acquire uh, an ECG signal, so basically you know the starting point of the heartbeat, and basically the, the data that you collect, you can just subdivide it 
uh, depending on the phase of your heartbeat. If it is just starting, it's heartbeat, so basically you can just take all your data and classify it based on that and obtain an image of the different uh, phase. So this is something that uh, is uh, known, but the, in our case, the, the challenge was to be able to do it without the ECG chain. It is based on a collaboration with a hospital, and basically they, they had some data that they collected from a, for an experiment, and then they found that the ECG signal was uh, not okay. I mean, the PET data was okay, but the ECG signal not. So it like, should we just go and prepare all the animals and all the stuff, or there's something that we can focus? This was wrong. So what is the problem? The, the issue is that this kind of approaches for humans have, have been like uh, the, the literature, many publications, and there are multiple uh, proposed ways, and they're more straightforward. In our case, the problem is that this is more or less on the scale of what is the size of a human heart compared to the mass. So we are going to very small scales, and on top of that, the heartbeat is much faster. So this makes things even more complicated and more challenging. So at the end, the number of counts, even if the uh, scanners, PET scanners for a small animal has better sensitivity overall and, and better resolution, it is uh, more challenging than, I mean, that's not the scale because you have the space and also the, the, the faster hardware. So, okay, so can, can it be done? So actually, like, uh, you have the, the least mode, and in principle, if you have motion, you should be able to, 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 to detect it because it is uh, there somehow. So we were uh, working on this, and, and actually the, the solution was uh, working pretty well with rats and with mouse. Uh, the phases that we have with the mice was, uh, more or less okay, not probably can be improved, but as I said, this is where uh, it was a little bit more complicated. Lucky enough, in our case, most of the studies and the work that they required was for, with rats, so, so at the end it was fine. So this is basically what we did. So uh, the idea is that you have all the data, and our approach was kind of uh, say straightforward in the sense that we just took the data, we back projected every, I think it is uh, written there, uh, 16 milliseconds. So basically, we were just getting images every 60 milliseconds, just back projected in a low resolution. So actually, uh, this is this can be done uh, really fast. And then the idea is that you can analyze uh, each pixel over time and detect uh, in a, a narrow time window the frequencies that uh, each box contains. And basically, you obtain this kind of plots on the top right. So basically, if you are in a region where you, it is affected by the cardiac motion, you're going to have a peak around the frequency of the the heartbeat. In this case, it is 6 uh, hertz. Uh, in this case, it is considered low, but because of the drugs that uh, they were studying in that case, but usually it is usually a little bit more. But you can see that a huge difference between uh, the blue line, that is the normal region, and the one that you, you can detect. So, in the cardiac region. So, and actually, it compared to the frequencies in the uh, ECG, actually, the match is uh, pretty well. So, basically, for each pixel, we have uh, the intensity in this region, in the area that's uh, of the 6 hertz, um, and basically we're obtaining the images as the, the one on image 2 on the, on the right, on the left, sorry. And this is basically the, the image of the, uh, let's say, the, the, the motion uh, intensity. So there is clear that it's easy to detect in any image where it's located the, the heart, and it's something that it is changing over time with this frequency. So the good thing is that we didn't have to do anything with any filter or anything like that, just back projecting and, and then analyzing. So this, at the end, was uh, really fast. And then just with some thresholding, we could actually detect, this is the image of overlap in the image from the pet and the image from the, the cardiac or motion. And basically, you can see that it is just the, this is the left ventricle, uh, where it is located, and um, uh, less than it on the right ventricle. So actually, this is something that could be detected. And then using this mask, we can just track uh, the, the variation of counts in that particular uh, region over time. And basically, we can obtain a signal that after filtering for that particular frequency, we can just obtain the starting point of the of the heartbeat. So, and compare in this case, it was some, some of the cases that we have the ECG and the, the, the initial point. So, basically, you get this dark signal that it is really noisy, but after some filtering, you obtain the signal that it is the red one, that it is not periodic. I mean, the, the assumption is we are not just fitting at like 6 hertz, but we let uh, like a broad band, and actually this, this is changing over time. And we let these two to vary. And we, after that, start applying. So we actually had to select where is our starting 
point for this uh, heartbeat. And basically, it's good that the point where it crosses the axis uh, of uh, uh, the horizontal axis, this is where we decided so this was the starting point, and it matches pretty well with the ECB. So with that, we obtain a, a really good agreement. And of course, then the point is like, okay, but does it work in uh, reality? And that's trying to find. So this is, you can see a profile through the, the heart without any gating. So basically, all the blurring. So this is the blue line. And on top of that, you can see the signal that you obtain from a, well, a diastolic uh, gate. So basically, one of the, the, the where the heart is more uh, dilated. And this is the uh, black one, and on top of that, the one that we obtain with our method, that basically matches uh, almost uh, perfect. It is not perfect, and sometimes actually the ECG was missing some heartbeats. So actually, it's something that we were just able just to drop that. At the end, with the ECG, you are detecting some of the uh, maximums in this signal, and sometimes the threshold. And of course, then the question again, uh, that this is what it was relevant for the biologists that, that we were collaborating with, is like, what is going to happen with uh, the, our variable of interest? Because all this translates into calculating the ejection fraction, so basically the, the volume between that's of the left ventricle between the diastole and the systole. So how much the heartbeat changes uh, relatively, and then the volume of the left ventricle. So actually, it's, uh, I mean it's a pretty good correlation, and we continue to learn a little bit more. And this is something that uh, is uh, interesting for the future is that. It is also possible to monitor the heartbeat without the PET scan, with the PET scan. Because as we are just detecting the localization of the heart, we can just continue and you can see that the heartbeat, the variability is, is quite uh, important. It can go uh, from six to, to seven, or well, in this case, it's a different animal. And in that case, also comparing with the ECG. So this is something that you can actually see during an acquisition of how the, the heartbeat, just analyzing the PET data. So, so this is. Uh, Actually, pretty interesting. So at the beginning, we need some time just to until we detect with the localization of the heart. And actually, it was interesting because it uh, it was being used just to detect any displacement on the heart because you can actually see if the heart, I mean, the uh, mouse itself or the whole it is just shifted because you can actually track the location of the heart easily with this kind of So, so this is something that uh, we work and it seems uh, that has some. Uh, Potential and there are ways to improve it, especially with uh, uh, with mice. I have seen that in human, it's something that it is now more or less uh, applied or, or, or a standard, but not going to much detail because it, the, the signal it is good enough with just localizing the, the I mean, without too much uh, refinement of, of the of the, for instance, the localization of the. So this is the uh, first topic. The, the second uh, thing that you yeah. want uh, questions per topic. Uh, as you as you wish. If you, I mean, just okay. in the idea that to have. Uh, I have a burning question now. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> uh, so the if if you show your spectrum, yeah. uh, it was obviously very clean. Um, yeah. I expected the harmonic, yeah. uh, and don't have one. So for this, because it's not, I mean, in this case, the way that it is done, that it is uh, with a window uh, uh, filter. So it is something that I was just shifting the window. So this is something that at some point I was just removing. So I was just, in this case, I think that allowing from four to eight or to 10. So basically I was allowing not only this six air, but something like this, but in the filtering process, it was- Yeah, yeah, sure, but in-, in Oh. Ah, in this case, yeah. well, it, it could be sad, but I think that it is removed after that. Uh, looking to some of the uh, the filtering process, that uh, I think that uh, at some point it was applied. But okay. yeah, it could be. I think that, and actually, there is something that I was expecting just to find also something on the um, respiratory motion that should be involved and actually was going to be in this area, but. Uh, with this, uh, because at the end, the, the, the kind of images that you obtain are low resolution, it's just the back projected, so the, the, the line motion was uh, very low in this case. But it is also interesting just trying to go and, and detect it. Uh, that, but that's... And, and if you have a very arrhythmic heartbeat, what would happen? So, sorry? If you have a very arrhythmic heartbeat. Yeah, actually, this, this is something that, I mean, that the, the only limitation is that in that case, whenever you are doing some of the filtering, your uh, window should be smaller. And, but uh, actually, I mean that. I think that in this case, yeah. it's changing pretty much. So I, I think that 
and the, the agreement is, is, is good enough. So actually, I mean, we're talking about uh, 16 millisecond frames, and I don't know, like uh, having like uh, uh, 200, six, something like this, so it just changes. So as long as there is enough counts, of course, then the question that we were asked, like, okay, but this is was with FDG, what happens if we have some other tracer that has less uptake in the heart? And the number of counts are lower, so I mean, uh, at the end there is a, a challenge there, but yeah, I agree. So if there is all the changes, but I think that especially in this case is that uh, was uh, really that, that that was the, the reason for for this kind of uh, of figure. That's okay. What is happening if there is no assumption that it has to be stable for a long period of time? But, so, but it may change. So. Good. Any. Any questions from online, Mike? Uh, on, oh, on, yeah. Yeah. Um, you plotted the ejection fraction and volumes on the same plot, but I mean, obviously, yeah. the scales are quite different. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, is. Ah, uh, oh, but this is, yeah, because I just plotted it on. Uh, yeah, I think I left. Yeah, should be the scale. I think that the scale, that figure is in top of the scale of the graph. So that's. Yeah, but I was just. Basically, in this case, what we were evaluating is the uh, value that we were obtaining with the ECG for some of these animals and the one that we were obtaining in, in our case. So, yeah, but that's, that's in one case is with a percentage and the other is in, in, in micro, micro dealers in this case. But yeah, I think that that's uh, the scale. Well, actually, I think that's no. Uh, yeah, I think that's yeah, that's uh, that's at the end what, what we did in this figure. So it's something that in this case then uh, it is 20 microliters, and in this case it means uh, 40 percent. So we were able to pack. Yeah, probably not the best uh, choice or to make it see clear, but yeah, at the end we were just using this to represent. Uh, I mean, the whole set of points. I mean, and the the whole point and actually the and the, the paper we had uh, other figures for that. So that's. Just to do a better analysis, but uh, the critical question for the biologists, like uh, they wanted to, to actually detect exactly that and detection fraction, and, and to, to be able to know. And actually, it is it is true that even in some of these, some of them that had a, a cardiac arrest, and then they were just trying different drugs. So, so actually, these are not all healthy animals. They they were doing a cardiac study for for that. So. This is actually something that, especially for the arrhythmias, at least, uh, was something uh, relevant. Okay, so the second topic is is something that uh, we have been working for uh, several years now, and, and actually has uh, created a controversy about uh, how it is possible, or how, or, or to which extent. It can provide an improvement in the images, and, and this is something that it is also good for for opening uh, questions. So the idea is that uh, typically uh, you know that when you are working with image reconstruction, I mean the the, the ideal concept that uh, a pair of detector or a detected coincidence just define a line of response or something the points that the emission comes from uh, is not narrow. So this supposed to be line, actually it's more like a tube or it is a large area and it, the more physics uh, that we include in our model, then the, the broader it becomes and if we even include all the scattering and everything, basically uh, we, you can have uh, activity or from contributing to this ferro detector from any point in the space. So at the end, what happens and what is the main effect of this uh, broadening of the uh, line of response? So basically, there's a limitation on, and it's known in the uh, resolution or, or better say the signal to noise ratio at this particular frequency. So this is something that it is uh, known and the question is that uh, if this can be improved by uh, subdividing the large uh, or the broad line of response into narrow ones. How can we do it? So basically the idea is that we can reconstruct and obtain an estimation of the image and from that should divide our line of response into smaller one. Actually, they, uh, we started working with this and in one of the, that it is called a multiplexing aspect. I don't know if you are aware of that. So this is where you have uh, multi pin holes in a spec and one detector can be connected to multiple holes. So usually in a spec, each detector or each point in the detector is connected with only one hole in the spec. 
uh, in the uh, uh, but in this case there are multiple uh, paths connected to at the same detector. So I was just in a, in a conference and in the US and they were just discussing about that the level of multiplexing can be should be lower than in that side don't know the number like a less than 27 percent. So for me it was kind of a random number and I was that's right. So, so one of the things I was working on when I was at, uh, collaborating with uh, Steve Moore at Bring Us a Woman was trying to figure out like a uh, ways to, to solve that. And, and basically we applied the same method but in, with the other geometry for respect and, and actually it worked uh, uh, pretty well as similar as this. Let me go to explain the methods and then we can just go about can. So the idea is that, uh, and this is how it is called, superlative <laughs> method. So I mean, there could be better ways to, to name it, but basically it involves multiple iterate, multiple reconstructions. So basically, uh, the idea is that we can have the data, we can obtain an estimate uh, reconstruction. The reconstruction should be, or, or, or there is no reason why not, to be the best one that you can get. Okay, that's your starting point. So you try to see if you can do it even better. And, and then the idea is that you can just, instead of assuming that you have a broad line of response, you can just subdivide each uh, detected uh, pair of coincidences into uh, several sublines. At the end, you can make it the way that the uh, probability distribution, uh, the overall probability distribution is the same. But in, uh, in this case, you are subdividing your tube of response into smaller ones, into several smaller ones. So then what we do is to, to we project using the smaller uh, tubes of response, and we assign or we subdivide our measure counts into these sub, uh, lines of response. Why we are doing that? Because then we are moving our problem to something that it is easier or uh, better to reconstruct. The statistics is preserved because the number of counts in total is preserved, but now instead of having, uh, for instance, if we should divide into three, we have three times more lines of response or that are narrower and the total number of counts is, is preserved. So what happens if we do this? Well, then you can see that the reconstructed images is improved because it converts better and actually has uh, better properties. And of course, we can use that again to repeat uh, this process several times. So basically, we do a whole reconstruction, a reconstruction with, let's say, three times more lines of response, and then we do it again. OK, so the question is, that does it work and, and how it is work? Well, actually, we even had to create a code just to convince some of our uh, collaborators that uh, actually like uh, you can try it and you will see that it works and, and there's some uh, properties that we understand some others on some cases where uh, the convergence or to prove how this is improved is still an open question so this is something interesting to 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 continue and basically the, the idea is that uh, this is the whole uh, thing in, in effect as i was explaining basically we were applying the same if you have one detector is connected with two lines of response you can just project in each of the two lines of response and from that, you can subdivide the counts that you have measured accordingly, proportionally. And then you reconstruct as there were no overlap. And actually, this removes the artifacts, and this 27% or something, it was not necessary. So, so the question is there, there are multiple ways to, to apply this because essentially what we do is to subdivide the tube of response into narrow ones or, or different ones. Actually, it's interesting because we can also try to apply it with a, a pseudo time of flight uh, tube of response and trying to see if this works or improves. In that case, uh, from what we saw, the, the improvement is not uh, that significant in that because uh, what you are losing in your first reconstruction is more resolution than on the signal to noise ratio that we could potentially expect to improve with the uh, subdividing into the direction. But basically, in this case, we, we just should divide it. Uh, there are multiple ways, as I said, you can just, uh, if you have in a matrix form, you can just should divide how you assign your random response connected to different pixels. And basically, you can do it like this. In this case, where with uh, assuming a Gaussian tube of response, we can just should divide it so that the total of the overall sum of the three Gaussian was exactly the same as the initial one. And just to, to show. So, Okay, so what are the results? In this case, we are working with this uh, scanner, which is a preclinical one. Actually, this is 
where uh, this is from a company in, in Madrid, uh, Sedeca, that this is where we are uh, mostly collaborating. And, and this, in this case, this is a four ring, so this is uh, something that has high sensitivity. And the interesting thing is that we started from, uh, well, with iteration, we go in this direction, but the, for instance, the standard, the blue line, is uh, initially the, the, the curve that we are getting with our best reconstruction. So this is the important thing. So we have our, our best reconstruction and then we try to improve it a little bit. So that's actually one of the key questions because it's not that uh, we, we know how to do it better without something like this, it's that we try to go a little bit beyond. So you can see that the, the recovery, so these are the recovery coefficients. So basically uh, we just have this kind of a, uh, this phantom that are the, the standard, the NEMA standard for preclinical. It has different uniform region, different uh, regions to evaluate the contrast and regions to evaluate well, the resolution or basically with the recovery coefficient that basically you localize regions and then you see how much activity you have there with respect to what you are expecting. And for the smallest one, you are typically going to have this kind of uh, factors around, I don't know, 30%, 40% because you are losing because of this uh, uh, resolution effect. So in this case, uh, we were able to improve for the same level of noise, which is important because it's not a matter of increasing resolution at the spaces of the noise. But we were basically having like a better system because we were going from the blue to the uh, green. Then if we repeat this process again, uh, we don't obtain uh, more improvement. This is something that we also saw with the uh, SPEC. So this was something that uh, is something that we were expecting. And this is something that uh, proves that typically we were, uh, can improve a little bit around, I don't know, that's 10%, 5, 10% of uh, the resolution. I mean, could be uh, a lot or not. So at the end, it depends on if it is just a matter of uh, doing the reconstruction twice. At the end, I think that it is, it is worth uh, doing it if it is possible or time is not uh, an issue. So, well, in this case, we also evaluated the possibility of a version of the scanner. In that case, uh, this kind of scanner has two layers of crystals, so it can detect on the front layer or the back layer just to, to reduce the depth of interaction. These scanners, the preclinical ones, are, are, are uh, the diameter is relatively small just to have better sensitivity. The problem is that you have a significant depth of interaction problem because the resolution could be affected when you go uh, far from the center. So in this case, what we did is to to see what happens in a scanner without that. So basically combining the counts that you have from the front layer and the back layer of the detector. Of course, in that case, the resolution uh, will be affected and then just evaluating if we can just go. So this is something that um, the layers, but we were just evaluating these kind of things. And this is something that, and, and then we went to do with uh, animal and cardiac studies again. So this is uh, another acquisition in this case with that scanner and we were obtaining very similar results. There is a uh, improvement around 10%, 5-10% uh, doing this method, but again, this is respect to our best reconstruction and then just uh, we get something stable. So this is something that uh, it is uh, worth exploring in terms of uh, if we can go beyond this or there are ways to, to enhance this, this kind of uh, approach. And, and of course, with uh, another, well, the length of phantom that is also used for resolution and, and actually this is the ones that actually are just uh, harder to obtain. I mean, when you evaluate resolution and you use a really small rods without any background, everything is easy. If you want to really check the resolution, it is better just to go to these ones. And, and actually, we were obtaining uh, also good results. And actually, it is consistent with what we saw in, in, other, in other. So this is from the superadist. I don't know if you have questions. Yeah. Yeah, in, in your uh, sub LORs, yeah. they're all uh, parallel, but in reality, you would have multiple angles. Yeah, well, actually, I mean, there, we, this is part of uh, Pablo Galvez's thesis that uh, defended uh, uh, some months ago. And actually, he was evaluating different ways and different approaches because, for instance, uh, Initially, we were just doing in the direction, for example, for the depth of interaction, just trying to do some divided. In other cases, we were just evaluating the axial direction or in the time of play direction. There are multiple ways and there is no resistance on, on this. So basically, 
what you do is you uh, if you have in a well this is with histogram data but it can be done with a, a, a list mode data so there is nothing basically you have one count and then you can just divide into so we were having something like this and and the subdivision is something that uh, we wanted to make sure that we were not changing the overall uh, sensitivity of the system so basically if we just discount counts from this and actually you can do it like a randomly so this is also something on the comprehensive so you can just subdivide it into different assignments so some of these uh, lines have short, uh, short, uh, LORs you can be creating kind of randomly and it is interesting to see how this uh, improves your image in terms of the frequency. I think that's uh, what it, the, the method it is doing and actually it's something that's trying to understand the, the properties better from the mathematical point of view. It's, it's interesting just trying to see the um, how it creates some extrapolation in the frequency domain that's a part of the frequency that you have lost because of the, the width of your lines of response is somehow trying to estimate it from the image itself because you already have because for a particular line that you are measuring uh, you have information from the uh, that is provided from all the other data through the image so basically you are just subdividing that and to improve it a little bit so it's something that uh, well it is worth exploring. I mean as I said the, the uh, reference uh, the main reference is, uh, is here, the first one. So it is, was uh, published last year, so from uh, Pablo Galvez, my PhD student. And, and well, I, of course, this is recorded and you can actually go. And I recommend you to, to take a look. So this is in, in Python. So we just uh, we're creating like a sample case and that can be played around and, and try to see in which cases. So this is, but yeah. Like a, yeah. Have you compared this with the standard in-app space deconvolution? Yeah, so so actually this is uh, something that we explore at the beginning that, because the problem with the deconvolution is that it was increasing the noise in the data to the same frequency. So there are ways to, to actually go try to, to do that without affecting your result uh, your noise. But uh, and the cases that we were evaluating, especially at the beginning, were quite noisy. So Trying to do this deconvolution without affecting the noise was something that was uh, complicated. So this is, and of course, this is something that if you have your starting uh, point, your image it is uh, even better. You can actually try to see how much you can even recover from, from that. So you can just go until you get to the limit of your world, uh, best possible limit that you can get. So if there are methods that you can do in between, well, yeah, you can just add them together. So this is something that so it is interesting from the point of view of uh, exploring. So this is why I was saying like exploring the limits or going beyond because this tries to improve. I mean, that's improving an image that is the best that we were able to obtain with uh, our, well, our current method. Not saying that they are perfect, but... Yeah. Okay, so let me continue. And of course, uh, this uh, question. So this is something that I'm uh, well, working on. Uh, Lately, and this is something that uh, I find it uh, quite uh, interesting, is uh, trying to use uh, moments instead of frames to analyze uh, dynamic pet data. The source for that, and I will explain later, is was because I had to do a very simple analysis, dynamic analysis, and I didn't want to spend uh, hours doing, uh, I don't know, 20, 30 different reconstructions because I just wanted to have a single parameter. So it's the activity is it stable or it is decreasing in a very noisy acquisition. So that the question was easy. So for answering a question that it is yes or no, or you only have one parameter, I didn't want to have like a 30 reconstruction of very noisy. And actually this is something that uh, I have not seen many discussion about because we know all our uh, methods of uh, scatter estimation and, and multiple methods just to, for instance, for this. But what happens when you are doing a scatter estimation with a noisy or very noisy acquisition as the initial point. Can you really trust your estimation of the scatter there or maybe the estimation of the scatter is 50% off or even more? So actually there is a huge problem there that if you want to really apply accurate methods to really, really noisy data at the one that you have, especially when you should divide your dynamic data into very small frames at the beginning of your acquisition, this is something that uh, could cause you a, a huge bias in your 
So this is the typical method. You get your data, you should divide it. I mean, de depending on how you, you work, but you should divide it into uh, different uh, frames, starting and, and final points. You reconstruct the images, you select your region, and from that you obtain a curve, and you obtain a feed, and you obtain the, the method. So this is, to say, standard. Of course, you can perform a 4D reconstruction, uh, and basically to perform your modeling directly when you are doing the reconstruction, but even uh, that has the, the, the problem that makes it's uh, complicated, or in some cases, you need to change your current reconstructor for or the software that you use to reconstruct on, and especially for uh, biologists or people working with this, it's not straightforward to understand what they are uh, doing in the reconstruction. So this is something that we wanted to see how to make it as simple as possible. And of course, the problems, as I mentioned, of the noise and the uh, low statistics, and the problem with the frames, and actually the number of frames for me, because in that particular problem, how many frames do you have to do if you just want to know if it is stable or if it is decreasing? Because you can just say like two, three, four, so it's something that's... Uh, so the idea is that, is it possible to do it without frames? So, and I will explain that it is connected with other different uh, approaches. So the idea is that to use uh, the time information of each event as a weight, so as I said, uh, now that I am with this perspective that I have the data and I apply weights to the data, this is something that it is somehow connected or, or related to that. So it means that instead of having, well, let's say, sinograms or just subdividing your uh, Lismo data uh, and just having one count per event, you assign a weight that depends on the time that it has been detected. You assign a weight that is the time 30 seconds or 30 seconds square or whatever weight you can use or you want to use. So with this uh, weighted data, you obtain images, and then you basically, you select your region of interest and you obtain the parameter. So basically in this case, it will be very similar to the feeding, but you don't have to use any, any frame. The advantage is that uh, from the point of view of the number of reconstruction, you can reduce it uh, greatly because you are encoding the timing information into your data and you can do it very efficiently. So the, for instance, in this case, this is the moment zero, so basically you are waiting by one, so it is the standard, all the uh, static acquisition, so you are not subdividing. For this one, you are waiting by the time, you obtain something that it is also high with a lot of statistics, no artifacts, and there is information in the time encoded in the difference between these two activities. That is not, uh, uh, can be that easily seen, but uh, I will show how, how this can be. What's the, what's the zero time? The reset. The moment zero? Ah, so, yeah, so in this case, uh, depending. So I was just, for instance, you can just, it's basically the total of your acquisition. So you basically... You're not dividing it into cycles? No, so in this case, you are taking the, the whole. Actually, there is a, a few cases. Time the yeah, so in this case, that will be a static acquisition because you are waiting basically by one and you are integrating so. So let me go a little bit into the mathematics of this. And, this is connected to the example as I was explaining. So imagine a situation like this, that you have a number of uh, time uh, or counts over time, and it is like this. And depending on how you model or how you make frames, if you make two frames like this, you may think that this is constant, okay? This is something that may happen if you have very low number of frames respect to what you are trying to analyze. And actually this is what the, how I started working on this. Of course you can do smaller frames, and then you can just detect that there is some, a trend there that you have more of frequent uh, counts as, as time uh, evolves. But this means that sometimes you are reconstructing with zero counts or one count or something, which is uh, hard to, to, to remember. But at this point, you have to think like, imagine that you have done all the work and you have reconstructed these uh, eight images. Now you perform, you select the region, you have these counts, and then you perform the fit. So let's go to check what happens when you are doing the fit. So for the fit of this equation, oh, you perform, you assume this equation, so it's a linear case, so it's saying, but you think about uh, what happens when you are doing the fitting or how the, the fit is performed. So basically you have the number of counts and the model that you are expecting. And from that, you can just say like, okay, if you derive respect to the parameters, you obtain uh, by optimization the, the parameters that are obtained like this. So the interesting thing here is that uh, you can obtain the parameters, and this is well, this is basically 
uh, simple maths, and this is how the, the least the square fit is performed. The parameters are obtained with just these two variables. One is the total number of counts and the total number of counts weighted by the time. So this is how this uh, started or how this uh, I was approaching this. So basically, you don't need to have the number of counts in each particular time point or with a smaller frames. You just need to have the total number of counts and the total number of counts weighted by the time. And of course, you can just continue with this reasoning in, in, in other cases. So this is basically what you would do with uh, doing a lot of frames. And at the end of the day, you are only interested in these two variables. And the same, you can just extrapolate it to something into you go to the continuum, or you just change the integral by uh, the, the sums by integrals, and basically you obtain something like this. And, and of course, this is another method that are, are being used in other fields. So this is also interesting that uh, this is not unique for this. But the good thing, uh, or the most critical thing, is that in our case, it's not that we are talking about single measurement. We are talking about reducing, doing a whole reconstruction just to get one data point per time, which is actually pretty. So what ways we can use, and this is something that I was exploring, and basically I realized that this is connected with many different uh, transforms and with many different uh, interesting mathematics. Basically, the first thing, and this is important, if we just use a step function between the initial point and the final point or something that it is uh, connected with a step function, this is our frame. So if we will just wait our data and everything that it is not within these two time points is zero, and then it, otherwise it's one. This is basically this one. We can use, as I said, like polynomials of the time, and it is connected to, to the Lagrange polynomial, but it could be also applied with a Fourier transform. And actually, we have been using this for uh, these cardiac studies, but there are good other possibilities that have been also explored in, in, in other modalities. So, okay, so the first thing, and this is something that's, uh, that was my initial target, uh, we could actually have, as I said, uh, moment zero image and the first moment, basically waiting events by time, and then just perform this separation of the parameter, which with the moments can be done uh, very easily. It's just a question, two equations and, and two uh, and two unknowns, and we can basically obtain which is the region where the activity is increasing, where it is decreasing. So basically here in the lungs and the heart and the, the rest that is more or less stable at that point. So you can just take it and basically obtain the, the separation. And for the linear fit, you can do it with just two acquisitions. You could, of course, you can do a lot of frames and then apply this. But if you just want to, to do something like this, it's possible. Uh, we also did it with a padlock analysis, so something more realistic, just having a, an, an input function. And then the activity with uh, FDG coming into, in this case, also in the uh, left bed, well, in the myocardium. And in this case, the analysis that we were comparing the standard path -like analysis with all these multiple frames or with just two reconstruction and obtaining the same results. So at the end, uh, mathematically, it's, it's, it's correct. And, and this is something that if you want to obtain only two parameters, you, don't have, you should not be doing 20, 30 reconstruction for just getting two parameters at the end. This is a, a possibility that it is much easier. And this is an experiment that, as I said, we are collaborating with uh, experiments in the uh, proton therapy. So this is uh, interesting because in this case, this is a, a foil that was placed uh, with uh, a proton beam and they were activating uh, carbon-12. So this is uh, being produced, carbon-12, uh, carbon-10, carbon-11, and, and oxygen-15. And the question in these cases is that how much activity do you have from each of these uh, radionuclei? So, and of course, you have this time activity curve, so the region that you have selected, if you are doing frames, so these are the, all the points. And of course, the question like, how many frames do you have to do to obtain the fit to the three exponential? Of course, the, the half-life of this species is known, but you don't want to know the amount that you have. And you can actually see, uh, well, the, the ones that the, the, the lines that we obtain are from the moments, and the other points are the ones that we were obtaining. As you can see, and this is something that we were expecting, you have a bias from the multiple frames because we were doing MLEM without any any other tricks. So basically, we have a positive bias in the image. So it is something known that MLEM because it imposes the positivity of the solution. If you don't try to correct for that, so there are uh, methods proposed. Uh, basically, what you get is something that you have more counts than you should. And of course, if you make the uh, frames uh, 
broader, so with more counts per frame, you can see that at the end it is converting to the case. So at the end, this is something that eventually gives you the solution of what is the optimal number of frames. It will be more or less wrong here, and in that case, the agreement that we obtain with the moments. But the good thing is that with the moment, we will only do three reconstructions and without thinking about what is the all this behavior. And of course, at some point with a, a small number of frames, there were some bias here, especially the for uh, the carbon 10 that uh, was significant in terms of the deviation respect to, to our thing. So this is something that uh, we have obtained and there are multiple applications of this kind of approach because uh, especially just reducing the, uh, well, the positive bias in cases like this or the problems of deciding how many frames to do, it's, it's something that it is in this case more significant. Of course, there are some open questions that uh, I think I left uh, at the end, but uh, uh, we can just say, especially one of my concerns is that working with uh, weighted data, the properties of the MLEM and there are algorithms that could be more adapted or depending on the, the bias that you are producing there. So this is something that uh, is worth exploring if there are ways to improve MLEM when you are working with weighted events and sometimes the Poisson statistics is starting now you have weighted Poisson events and this is something. Uh, you and certainly quantification, if you're fitting a, a function to a set of function, you yes. error estimate, but you can directly estimate it from the moment. Well, actually, the, this is something that uh, uh, we were doing, uh, for instance, one additional moment to the ones that we, to, especially to, uh, to understand that. Well, just to have an idea if the fit was good or not, we were just doing one extra moment. Because otherwise, okay, so if the function is like this, we can expect this value, and then we were just exploring if it is significant or not. But yeah, this is a concern because usually, as you said, when uh, when we have something like this, we know if the fit works well or not, and otherwise. But for for that, we we added one extra that it was not required, but we are only using a few uh, cases, and and it is good just to do. So yeah. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting. Um, I was just thinking kind of about the long paper by Richard Carlson. Yeah. Is, is this. Uh, Actually, I was presenting this and, and, and Richard Carlson asked, me, like, okay, I did something like this and then, like, uh, but the, back in the uh, early 80s, and then I was just reading. Uh, and actually, it's interesting because the way that initially, uh, and then we were talking after that, uh, that uh, in a conference, and the way that this was done was. Okay, you can apply uh, the, um, and actually it's good that we can include, for instance, the decay correction if we want just as a weight since during this for each event. So it's something that is, you can use it. And they initially were doing with a uh, uh, decay correction and no decay correction, and they were having two separated weights because at the end it's like an exponential and no exponential added to that. So it's something that naturally, and then just comparing. So it is especially re related to that. So in that case, they were just exploring like a two of these or just, but not in trying to do it like a, a formal or just including. But actually, yeah, yeah we, were, we had a, a, a different, like, I mean, because I was asking like why they did not continue with, with this, because I mean, if at the end someone has to, let's say, reinvent what they were doing, like, okay, why did you not continue? Like, and it says that, okay, I think that people were able to have more computational power to do frames and to do multiple images, and then they were not interested in doing a, let's call it a smarter or uh, however or whatever you want to call it, but just thinking of better ways. But in this case, uh, for me, the, the main motivation was that uh, try to, when I was exploring what is the scatter correction for one of these noisy frames was, I mean, I can just imagine that anything could be fit into that uh, particular case. I mean, because it's too noisy that, uh, I mean, there's no way you, you can claim that this is uh, quantitative, especially at the beginning, of course. Eventually, you think that okay, with the feed, you will just don't care about some particular points, and everything will just go. But, but I think that it is uh, really interesting just trying to, to see how much you can get, especially reducing the, the number of acquisitions or the number of reconstruction for that. So, yeah. How, how did you do your scatter correction in this case? Yeah, the, the good thing is that you can apply. It's just a way that you are. It's that imagine that you can apply the scatter correction with. Uh, Decay correction or not, you don't think so. It's basically an exponential that you are adding to your events with particular points. So, so basically, you can just the the weights in the time it does not affect to your no. because it will just be separate. So that 
actually it's good. And actually for the random correction, it is the same. You just apply for each random the same weight that you would apply. I mean, you can, uh, that's actually the best thing, that you can just take whatever uh, reconstruction software that you are using, and you can just adapt your data. And as long as you can play with or work with uh, uh, non-binary data, that basically you can, instead of having one or zero, uh, you can use a weight, either with sinograms or with a list mode, you can just use it directly. So this is something that... So, okay, let me go to the last one. And actually this is one of the uh, most recent one is just trying to see, of course, like a, uh, with the positron range correction that's in our group we have been working for for many, many years with a few thesis uh, working on this and, and, and working on the modeling and, and, and correction using GPUs and now going to uh, deep learning because uh, I think that this is one of the, let's say, the low hanging fruit that uh, for deep learning, this is one of the most straightforward problems because you are dealing with uh, blurring and, and with convolutional neural networks. Uh, blurring is something that can be part of the, the process of the of what the uh, layers of the neural network are doing. So, okay, so the, the goal in, in our case, we were focused on Galio 68 because it's the, the one that uh, especially uh, has been approved in, in Europe, especially in, in Spain, for uh, some applications, and, and now it is uh, more accessible with all the uh, with generators, uh, and more and more hospitals are starting to, to to have access to this. And, I mean, in, in Spain we have a lot of restriction to access to isotopes, so it is uh, something big when we have access to something like this. Of course, with rubidium in 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 the US, were available for many years, and, and it's something that's also Interesting, although it has been more and more uh, uh, reduced its use and for instead of uh, using ammonia and other alternatives. But Gallium 68 has a, a lot of uh, good advantages in terms of accessibility and, and now uh, being used in hospital is something that uh, is, is well. But the main issue is that the, the uh, especially physicians who are used to the resolution with chlorinating images, they go to Gallium 68 and they're like, okay, this is not that good. And if we go to preclinical images with a small animal, this is even more significant because the positron range basically depends on the uh, on the material that it propagates and energy. So the effects on the resolution, the high resolution of the preclinical scanner is more significant. So you can see here that uh, uh, the, the mean range, and of course, there is a lot of things to be said here about that one thing is that the global up, uh, blurring that it creates, but also the, the large uh, tails of this distribution that may create additional artifacts. But you can see that in the lens, eight millimeters is, is actually much greater than the uh, boxed size even for the preclinical. So if we go to low uh, density regions, this, this could have a, a significant effect. So, okay, so how can we, uh, how did we approach this? Well. Basically, you can see here that uh, we were just trying to, and that, that was our goal, to take images from Galileo 68, reconstructed images. So, I mean, there are multiple ways to do it, but this was our approach, and try to make them look like if they were reconstructed with Florin 18. Why Florin 18 and not going to the uh, positron distribution? Well, because in this case, we were having access to images with Florin 18 and, and just trying to see the properties. And in principle, images reconstructed with Florin 18 are assumed to have corrected for the uh, Florin 18 positron rate somehow, even if it is not explicitly any measurement or some point spread function modeling has been obtained with source, with Florin 18, with positron range there. So basically the PSF or any method that it is used is correcting implicitly the positron range, even if it is not explicitly indicated. So that's why we didn't want to go beyond that and basically be fair and try to see to obtain the same kind of uh, image quality with Galio 68 and Florin. So this is basically one of what we published in 2020, and, and actually we have one more coming, uh, especially just going uh, in more details, especially for uh, more cases and more scan. So in this case, you can see the images of what is the positron emission, positron annihilations uh, with uh, two radio tracers, and you can actually see the difference. So this is again with a, a small animal, because in this case, if you were it is more significant impact and you can see that it's not just a blurring for instance in, in the, some of this region but also if you think about the, the lines you can see that uh, the, the positron rays can 
for instance, create this, this kind of artifact that there is low activity here and increase in some areas. And this is something that actually is seen in some of these images because you have less annihilation here and, and then positrons are traveling through the lungs and then being annihilated at the at the pleural line or some of the of the ribs. So and actually this is something that we also see that the bed of the scanner you can actually see with gallium cystic that there is an annihilation coming from the animal and, and this. And actually in, in some clinical acquisition with gallium 68 or, or iodine 124 that has large positive rate, you can actually see the bed because of this annihilation. So, so this is something that uh, we know how to, to model. And as I explained, so basically the idea is that trying to go from these images with positive range effect to the one that is not. One thing that people are not usually describe is just the effect is not just a blurring, but also increase a lot of the noise because basically when you are doing the reconstruction, the localization of their events basically start to have possibility of being uh, from many multiple regions, so it is not that uh, localized. So at the end, it creates all these possible backgrounds. So, so this is actually, you can think that what you are describing without the positron range is basically the uh, positron annihilation image. So actually, it's something that you can just be happy with. I mean, this is not the positron emission tomography, it's positron annihilation tomography. So if you don't use positron correction, you're not doing it, you're doing fine, something like this. So, but it's okay. I mean, normally you can assume that they are the same. So, so how did we do all this? So this is kind of, a, well, this is the, the master thesis of one of my current PhD students, uh, Elian Thina, and he's, he has been working on the pipeline just to, to basically do all the steps required to, to train a neural network and then obtain the result. So, we were doing a uh, has multiple ingredients. I will talk a little bit about uh, our simulator because it could be of interest for, for you. But basically, we obtain different models of the animal from uh, multiple sources. Then we simulate with a, a model we adapted. Uh, so Penis is one of the codes. It's open source code that it is a uh, part of the Penelope family that we have been working on for years uh, with, sorry. And this is something from a group in, in Barcelona. And what we are doing is to simulate with uh, two different radio tracers and obtaining that image. Of course, that image is not the one that you would get in a scanner because you have all the detection, all the noise, and all the. So basically, what we do is to, we just have the, also the, the density and material distribution. We obtain, we simulate, we obtain data with a, a different statistic, and then we obtain, uh, perform the reconstruction. And these are the images that we obtain. So we have a pair of images uh, that has been going through all the process with Florent 18 and Gallium 68. And our goal is to go with uh, train the network that turns uh, images of Gallium 68 into the same uh, with the quality of uh, Florent 18. So we can do this with uh, multiple slices, then uh, we can just perform uh, in a many ways. So I included this, uh, and actually this is something that the paper is uh, under review, so let's, uh, we probably will have all the details, but the code is already available. So, I mean, there are more descriptions uh, in, the, in the paper, but uh, this, will, this is something that you can just take a look. So this is a Monte Carlo simulator. So it is, I don't know if you know the uh, Monte Carlo GPU code that it is from, was developed for X-ray, so this is used uh, in CT imaging a lot because for that, if you want to simulate or to have a Monte Carlo simulation, you require a huge number, like a two, three orders of magnitude more than in PET. So you need to have a lot of uh, car simulated. So Andrew Badal working at the FDA in the US so was working on this, and then we collaborated just to, to move that into the uh, for for PET, just adding all the required tools. And basically, we were just having the uh, with attenuate with annihilation and uh, material density just simulated. And good thing is that we can just simulate that to uh, what, hundreds uh, of million decays per second, which actually, of course, then you include the sensitivity. So we are basically more or less collecting like a million coincidence per second of the detected. So, of course, it has some approximation, but it's, it's really good just to do something like this because otherwise, if you use simulations with let's say gates this could take I don't know, thousands of years until it is so you need different approach to, to basically if you want to create enough cases to train a neural network for it. so basically we have uh, all the different profile we can just simulate also with a 
prong gammas with, uh, in this case, it's with iodine 124. And so we have the prongs, the randoms, and all, well, from the data and also from this one. And obtain a, a, a really good agreement with the data. And right now, one of the applications that we are using is for directly obtaining the scatter correction with the simulation. It's so fast that you can just basically have your activity and do just the simulation to obtain the scatter without any assumptions. So basically, you simulate the whole system, and because it is so fast, you can just have it in a few seconds, a good statistic for that. So how can you uh, train a neural network for this? I'm not going to get too much into the details uh, uh, unless you ask me for. But uh, basically, the idea is that what uh, we are using is that the, the positron is, sign, uh, is very local, the positron rate, what we are modeling. So we don't have to use the whole volume of input and output to train a neural network. So basically, we should divide it into a small 3D volumes. And these are the ones that we are using as <coughs> pairs of uh, Gallium 68 and Florin 18 to train a neural network. So with all the subdivision, we had uh, a lot of uh, cases to train the, the neural network. And basically, using well, this kind of training that it is pretty common. So in the, the case of the neural network, we spent uh, not too much time because the, the most difficult part was to, to get good uh, input data. So these are the results of, um, of the Florent 19. Again, uh, you will you have seen a lot of uh, cardiac images of animals, but uh, I think that this makes it even more uh, clear or easy to follow. So this is the Florent 18. You got the, with Galio 68, it's hard to, to see the, the, the walls. In this case, not probably the best uh, resolution image, but I think that in this case, it's with the in scanner and, and trying to replicate one of these acquisition, but you can see that well, this is Richardson Lucy, so it's at the convolution, so I guess that it's connected to the, the convolution in image space. That's good. And, and of course, I mean, that it's hard if you don't have something like this to be able to, to model it. And the, then the question is that if there is only a small uh, information there, how can you be able to recover that information? And of course, just adding the layers of the anatomy, and, and then I guess that this is also interesting from the uh, uh, synergies between multiple modalities, because if you include here the information for the neural network of the PET and also the anatomy, and how you combine all this, so it is actually an interesting way to, to, to explore. Uh, uh, but basically, I mean, the, the results, and then we were exploring about, uh, okay, of course, this is a simulation, this is data that we have not used for training, but of course, it is kind of very similar to the ones that we were using for training. Even if we don't uh, use any of these during the training, there is uh, also some similarities that probably the network is exploring. So what we did is to go and, and well, this is a well, quantitative analysis of, of the result. But, uh, of course, I think that visually you can just see that uh, we obtain images from the Galaxy system after the correction that are pretty, pretty similar, but then uh, what we are exploring now is just how this can be applied to uh, real data from, from the scanner. And, and of course, there are uh, things to, to explore about what is the robustness of the methods, how much or how many cases are, uh, additional that we need to, to include, and, and everything else. But at least from the point of view, uh, and also the problem of how to validate uh, with uh, real data that your values are obtaining are correct. So there's a, a lot of uh, there is in open questions, but at least we don't get anything that's a, yeah, well, for the bladder, we are getting something that makes sense. And, and then there's some quantification studies on the other regions. But it is something that, uh, uh, in principle, it, it works uh, well and, and it is uh, going for it. And well, the code is on uh, GitHub, so it is available. We are basically, uh, the goal is to include uh, other scanners and basically to have a model for. It's particular type of scanner or resolution for the images because the voxel size has to match the one that has been used for the training, but apart from that, it's not uh, that complicated. So, okay, that was the last part from the PET, and I don't know what you have a question from the positron and neural networks. It's kind of yeah, you know, well, I left some open questions that maybe we can discuss, and, and let me go and, and show you this. That is, uh, yeah. I mean, the main effect that you've shown in the results is uh, improving the resolution locally. Yeah. Not specifically at mismatched scales, and as you said, the end of the line is. Yeah. 
Yeah, sure. What's happening there? But what do you mean, like a mismatch on, like a? So, so I mean, the qualification here is presumably on. Yeah, here's in the uh, the the lang. So the lang has with the uh, large positron range, you can see that there is a more radicalization at the border or the ribs and the pleural lines are not in the lang. So this is where the activity is reduced compared to to the fluorinating, and and then you recover that. So I mean, yeah. So so basically, we we did that. So it's not just a local convolution, but it is more broad. So actually, uh, right now, what we are doing, and this is something that it's important to mention that for those who are interested in this, like trying to increase the size of our uh, uh, sub volumes, because uh, for instance, we were not able to model the uh, removing the bed activity because our volume is not large enough to model activity from coming from the animal and getting to the, and well, uh, it's just a, a memory problem that we need to handle and basically it's solved by getting funding for uh, more expensive uh, GPUs, but, but we were just thinking about ways just to, to handle this and try to, to, to have larger kernels for, for modeling this. I mean, for all this, it's, it's good enough, but it could be, I mean, wasted to do that. So. But yeah, it's not solely, so this is actually why we were including this, this analysis, because, I mean, I have all the uh, reasonable doubts about, okay, how this works, and I was just doing it until I was more or less convinced that it has potential, but so of course, uh, the, one of the most interesting was how can you design experiments to actually prove that you are doing things correctly. You include like a, actually we were doing one of these experiments just uh, with a proton activation and then you're producing gallium 68 and gallium 66 and gallium 67, producing all of them and they have different positron range. So then you can potentially do an experiment like this and you inject and you can see so actually it was kind of interesting. We have a, a publication, but it's on a nuclear nuclear physics uh, experiment, but just analyzing this and you can actually see that the positron and the blurring changes over time. So it's, that's, okay. yeah. Variation by you including in the entry data there, I mean, for example. Yeah, so, so this is, this is, I mean, we try, especially uh, for the model, so because we have, I mean, all the segmented uh, and the anatomy and for different and then the distribution among organs. So in some cases we have segmented images and then we were just assigning the same activity per organ, which is not realistic. In other cases when we were using the activity from a reconstructed image, which is not exactly as the activity itself. So we were, yeah, because, but in that case we have some variability. So there are, we're trying to include multiple cases and also uh, for the how many data we are using. We're also exploring just having like a images that are more noisy initially when we're applying this. So they're trying to, to explore all the possibilities. But how much data is needed is one of the burning questions about, uh, or how variability, how much variability, especially what we do is, uh, and also when we apply for different organs, is to include multiple activities for the same organ. So it doesn't I mean, we have like a different tracers and distribution. Of, just trying to avoid any that the neural network learns about that. Okay, this is the bladder, it has to be really hot, but in some cases, you're trying to have a bladder that it's not that hot, and basically just trying to, to, to understand that. Whole. So, it is something that uh, is requires uh, more exploration, especially just trying to, to, to be 100% that you will not create any uh, significant art. So, Okay, so the last, and this is the, the bonus, and, and hopefully you, you find it interesting. So basically, this is uh, something that we started working on, uh, the combination of ultrasound with uh, PET, which is not just PET with MRI and other modality, you can just include it with ultrasound. And actually, we had a, a, a project on creating this, so basically just trying to, to use the ultrasound to provide information, not just for the anatomy, but also for quantitative properties. So there are interesting things when you go from the standard ultrasound that basically you you're propagating uh, uh, waves uh, acoustic waves through a medium and then just getting the uh, the reflection when there is a change in the impedance is the product of density and the speed of sound uh, and basically this is the typical images that you you are uh, you may think of of a uh, 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 pregnant woman or or some uh, tissues like the, the heart or kidneys so this is something that it is a standard. So the question is that, okay, what happens if instead of just looking to the 
uh, reflection, you can also detect the transmitted image, the transmitted point. So in that case, it gives you the possibility to access to more information about the well, as, as we do in, for instance, in the city or the attenuation gives you information about the attenuation of the uh, sound as it propagates and it gives you information about the tissue and also the speed of sound in the material. So you can actually see that the uh, why we are doing all this. Well, one of the reasons is that it provides quantitative information that reduces or improves the uh, segmentation of tissue or just if you're interested in some of these, for instance, the speed of sound of different tissue in, in, in breast and the attenuation. And you can see that uh, there are multiple publications saying that uh, uh, cancer tissues and there is uh, like the malignant ones has higher speed of sound and higher attenuation. So basically you can just focus on, on try to, to, to select more and to, to reduce the number of uh, false um, false positives that you are having with a mammography or other modalities. And actually it's interesting because for instance, the, uh, the attenuation relative to, to blood of different tissue change a lot from different, uh, and it is changing way more than what you see when you are just with the speed of sound or the density. So the, if you get access to the attenuation properties of tissue, acoustic attenuation, you will be able to, to, to differentiate much better the different tissues. So this is something that it is uh, well, really motivating. And well, for me, to be honest, the idea is that, okay, if it is a much harder problem than uh, PET image reconstruction, then I'm all for it. So this is basically, the model that it is used for uh, reconstruction. So you have one emitter and you have a system like this. You can create a, a ring if you are just exploring uh, uh, an interesting in mammography. You can just create this kind of a ring around your organ of interest. And then for each emitter and receiver, you can assume that you have this light source response. And again, it's pretty similar. And you can just do a reconstruction about the, with the time that it takes from the meter to get to the receiver and from that you, you reconstruct the, the speed of sound. The, well, the problem is that well, waves are, does not propagate or not necessarily propagate uh, it through the uh, straight line, but it follows that, that uh, the shortest path and depending on the velocity, they are going to be uh, refracted like, like this. So basically these are in cases like this could be like a more realistic uh, ways to describe. But of course, in this, this is what makes things complicated because in order to know which is the right path, you should know which is the velocity, but the velocity is what you need to know. So then you require to do it in a, in a very iterative way until you do. This is a possible one and it is being done, but of course you can also do it just taking into account all the whole wave uh, propagation and in that case it's more uh, computational intensive and, and basically you can just obtain something like this. That's there are going to be all the kernels that are connecting the middle with the receiver and you will obtain something that gives you more realistic. So this is pretty similar to what happened in, in, in PET. You can start with a, a something like a, a FVP reconstruction, assuming these ideal lines, and then you start adding more and more physics into that, and you obtain better images. The equations I'm not going to get into detail. Basically, what you are having is just for each particular emitter and receiver, you have a pressure wave that is just a, a wave uh, that uh, is changing over time, and you have your estimation and your wave, and in this case, what it is done is just to reduce the uh, differences uh, in overall differences square. You add or you integrate over time, and you do it for the whole emitter detector. And basically, you, this is what you want to to reduce. You get to a point that your model reproduces your data. In this case, they're not described by uh, Poisson statistics, but more in a Gaussian, assuming Gaussian noise, and basically. And of course, you can also include some uh, uh, total variation or some other uh, regularization there. How can you well, uh, obtain this parameter? Basically, you derive respect to your parameter of interest, and then you, with a gradient descent, basically, this is the uh, standard way to, to optimize any problem like this. And basically, the difficulty is how to estimate how this change with a small variation of the speed of sound in the voxel. But you obtain a, a formulation that it is uh, can be implemented quite uh, nicely. And uh, well, this is uh, this is done typically in a, a frequency domain, but we were doing the time domain because for us it was more intuitive. So basically, what you do, similar in the iterative, you have your measured data, the blue line, and the red line is the um, synthetic data. And basically, you can just 
more and more until you get a speed of math, a sound that it matches. So, so okay, uh, well, this is more on the technicality of how we do it because this function has a lot of uh, local minima, so this is actually one of the challenges and what we do is to, to basically uh, implement it in a way that the, what we try to optimize is, is go from a low resolution to better resolution and with more local minima, but uh, we, we start with this, we are obtaining an optimization that we have a one good uh, estimation until we get to something that is more uh, close to the optimality. And, and well, these are the, in this case, again, with a preclinical, but this has been also using, as I said, in, in mammography. Actually, there's uh, now a few systems that are, are now commercially available or they're trying to, to I mean, the field is starting to, to grow. This is a very uh, brand new field in terms of uh, application or systems uh, being used uh, clinically. And uh, uh, you can see this is the uh, optoacoustic, so this is a different modality. This is where illuminating with lasers and detecting with ultrasound, but it's something that can be used with this. Reflectivity, and these are the images. So this is with the uh, rays, with the bent rays, which is not a fully physics, and then you can just go to higher uh, resolutions, and this is the one described. So you can see, and this is my last slide, how basically, in this case, there is a, actually I was using more on the synergies between different MRI and PET and just trying to move it here and actually just because the reflectivity image so this is uh, this doesn't look like the typical ultrasound image you are used to because in this case you are seeing the same from multiple views so eventually you can just do it uh, with the satellite but it basically shows you the reflectivity in its particular point it has good resolution but it is not quantitative and even with the reflection you can also need to in principle, you can improve this resolution with a uh, speed of sound because this will be also benefit from the speed of sound. And in this case, uh, the information is quantitative, but it can be used the reflectivity to improve the resolution because the boundaries between the different tissues, you can use this as a prior or something for filtering. So for me, it is more like the, if you combine PET and MRI, you, there are ways just this can use the information here and just try to see how can you. So in this case, um, there's possibility just to use uh, both of them uh, right now. And I think that that was one of your questions in the conference, so that was good. So actually, I was just thinking, so that the way that it is implemented in one of these scanners is just, this is reconstructing first, so I get access to this before I reconstruct this. The way as I've been doing it uh, for uh, other cases is just, I get this, I reconstruct this, I use this to improve this, and then I continue. So, yeah, so actually, yeah, yeah, I was thinking like, yeah, at the end I'm doing this combined and I'm basically using this as a, with a uniform velocity, I reconstruct this and with this map of, I mean, the variation is not that significant, but it affects your, your resolution. It may change that uh, it's not, there, there are a few things, for instance, there's things like the bone where it is not penetrated, so there appears as black, if it were like completely quantitative, this would be like a very high uh, speed of sound, much higher. But because the information is lost, uh, well, this is something that is left there. This is a list of open questions, but I'm afraid that I took much time. So here we were. Yeah, but this is something that, uh, I mean, like, uh, can we use deep learning with all these and with this? Uh, there are ways that uh, this method could not uh, convert, or how, for instance, that the, how to select the best subdivision of the lines into small ones, or so I said that uh, maybe using uh, some compressing or some random subdivision. Uh, how to work with weighted events and with uh, deep learning, there is all the problems that how can you use combined simulated and real data, and how to play with uh, that or how to be sure that you have used enough cases for your scanner, or if someone decides just to do an experiment that it was not included at all in the kind of data that you have been trained in your neural network, if it is going to be robust enough. Because the problem with neural network is that they are not linear, and when things are not linear, anything can happen, or at least can go way beyond what you expect. So, uh, like, uh, yeah. well, thank you.
we, we will have to run uh, quite soon because we have another meeting. But uh, it, maybe just one question from online, if anybody wants to ask a quick question. Yes, sorry for the camera, it has to be Spanish, eh? but yeah. yeah. Uh, no, uh, I, I think you will be seeing most people uh, tomorrow morning anyway, so maybe detailed questions on many of these projects we can then uh, ask and we'll close the meeting now. Thank All right. Thanks again. Thank you all for joining online. And, uh, yeah, just a brief reminder that tomorrow we have a seminar by Craig Levin. Uh, details are on the Synergy website. Uh, that's